Welcome to the Addiction Mindset Recovery Coaching YouTube channel. For those of you that are new here, my name is Dr. Frank. I'm the founder of Addiction Mindset Recovery Coaching Programs, which are dedicated to helping people quit nicotine, THC, energy drinks, and adult media content, substances that I personally once struggled with. In today's video, I'm going to share with you guys a complete guide on how to quit smoking weed from beginning to end. This is a long video, but I promise you, if you hang in there with me throughout this presentation, it will be well worth your time. All right, without further ado, let's get it. So this is a quitting weed masterclass. It's brought to you by my company, Addiction Mindset Recovery Coaching. And I guarantee you that this program is about a lot more than just getting sober. Because if my only goal, if my only intention was to get sober, I promise you, I eventually would have got bored of that. And I probably would have fell back into some of my addictions. This is our uh, addiction mindset logo for those of you who are unaware. All right. First things first, this used to be a paid program that I would run with people. Okay. And it was one of our most successful programs. And I'm giving it all away for free. And this is for two primary reasons. Reason number one, I'm very grateful for the platform that I've been given here on YouTube. And I believe if you give, you shall receive. And I want to give back. And I think this is a great way of doing it as we approach 100,000 followers here. Reason number two, and more importantly, okay, I don't want to sound like I'm just some self righteous person who's giving. I decided years ago to stop making excuses for my behaviors and for my actions. And that was one of the best decisions that I had ever made for myself. I became so sick and tired of saying over and over again, I'm going to quit today. I'm going to quit tomorrow. Maybe next week. Maybe next time. I got sick of hearing myself. And now, after doing addiction recovery coaching programs and running them online for the last several years, I'm getting tired of reading the emails and the DMs that are just a series of excuses as to why people can't. Specifically, the people that say, oh, I wish I could afford your program. I wish I could be part of this. If only I could do this, then I could quit. I'm giving this away for free because I don't want you to leave this presentation with any more excuses. I, I, if, if you want to quit and you want to make a change, I want you to have everything that you need to do so. And that's exactly the purpose of today's presentation. Okay. Uh, for what it's worth, if you feel so inclined, I still offer one-on-one -on -one coaching programs. We have a support membership community. We have merchandise available. I use products and affiliate links that I'm going to reference throughout this program. And you can find those in the video description or the pinned comment. I get a small commission off of Amazon if you purchase through those links. And I would really appreciate that. And you can also make channel donations if you so feel inclined. This video is part one of a three-part series that I'm going to be releasing. Motto number one for today is whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. And this is arguably one of the worst side effects of addiction. I said to myself, and I hear countless times over and over again, I can't quit. I'm not capable of. And what this mentality does, what addiction does, the manipulation that is addiction, is it creates a subconscious rot in our minds, a rot that started to spill over into multiple aspects of my life. It started to spill over into my business. It started to spill over into my relationships. It started to spill over into my physical fitness, the shape that I was in. I can't. It's too hard. I'm not capable of. And in whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. So the first thing we want to do, the first step to quitting any addiction isn't talking about the withdrawals, which we're going to talk about today. It's fixing the mind because addiction, it breaks our mind. It breaks our mindset. That's how it takes advantage of us. It breaks us down. But today we're going to change that. That's exactly what we're going to do. Who's really in control. Okay. There's two ways to look at addiction. You could view addiction as a disease. And I inherently recognize that there are disease processes that occur in the brain once we've been subject to a substance for a long enough period of time. Or you could view addiction 
as a choice. You could view addiction as a lack of discipline to a large extent. Now, I don't want to piss people off. There's no need. Well, actually, I don't care if I piss you off. Just don't bail on this yet. Hear me out. When you start to view addiction as a choice, when you start to view addiction as a discipline problem, a problem that a majority of people have, myself included, something I still try and improve every day on, suddenly it's not so overwhelming. Suddenly it's something that you're in control of. And suddenly it's not as daunting as perhaps what a disease is. And for me, this was a monumental shift in mindset when it came to quitting. Let's review this. Just because you want something doesn't mean that that something's good for you. Just because you want to do something doesn't mean that you should do that something. And this is inherently the flaw with dopamine, one of the primary neurotransmitters involved with addiction. Dopamine, although yes, it makes us feel good, you may have heard of it before, it's responsible for driving us to repeat a behavior over and over again, independent of the consequences of that behavior. This is one of the primary neurotransmitters that addiction, whether it's cannabis, nicotine, alcohol, pills, takes advantage of. And today we're going to fix this problem that it's created. Keep this in mind throughout the course of this program. Just because you want something doesn't mean that you need it. There's lots of things every single day that I want to do that I don't do because I know it's against my better judgment. I know that the actions I take today are going to determine how I live my life tomorrow. I've come to understand through sobriety and through recovery that I will sacrifice now for the things that I want to obtain later on in my life. This is what addiction recovery is all about. There's also lots of things that I don't want to do on a day-to-day basis, but I do them because they ought to be done, because they have to be done. And I think these are good mentalities to start to approach quitting with. You are in control, not the addiction. And this is the most fascinating thing to me that just blows my mind when it comes to addiction. It's been proven that the area of our brain in which addiction lives, that primal area, that animal brain, is not responsible for driving a motor movement, i.e. picking up a bong, lighting a cigarette, picking up a drink and pounding more alcohol. That, That action comes from our human brain. Addiction can manipulate it. But I want you to keep something in mind because at the end of the day, you are in control of this. And that is a much more positive outlook than it being some mysterious disease process that no one has a cure for that we can't control. Okay. And if you do firmly disagree with me, I would probably recommend you do leave the video now. Um, Push into the pain. The more you push into pain, the more pleasure you're going to experience in life. And I can prove it to you. Okay, you have been leaning in. If you're anything like me, chasing that pleasure, chasing it down, finding it in a drink, finding it in your next smoke, finding it in your vape, finding it in adult media content, whatever it is you're addicted to, gambling. And what has that pain created for you? What has that, I'm sorry, that pleasure, that pleasure created for you? More pain. And this has to do with how dopamine functions within our brains. The opposite of this also happens to be true. When you push into the pain, when you push into the discomfort, when you go into the things that are hard, the reward is actually pleasure. Now, there's an incredible book that I recommend anyone watching this video purchases. It's called Dopamine Nation. It's by Dr. Anna Lemke. She's the head of Stanford Medicine Addiction Centers, okay? She is one of the most profound speakers out there on addiction. She's a psychiatrist, but she a psychologist, psychiatrist, and she tells it how it is. This book is eye-opening. Once you understand how your brain works and how these neurotransmitters work, and what's going on in your body, what's going on in your brain, I promise you quitting becomes a lot easier. And she spends a lot of time talking about weed, and she spends time talking about adult media content in this book. Now, another book that I would recommend to anyone watching this video is Rational Recovery by Jack Trimpey. It's going to help with the identification of the addicted voice. This book does a phenomenal job at creating separation between you and the addiction and helping you realize that there's more to you 
than a substance, that these are two separate issues, okay? Now, please, if you do get the books, check out the video description and pick them up from the affiliate links. It really helps out the channel. Here's my promise to you as we go through this, as you start to quit. Good days and bad days are ahead. The bad days are completely unavoidable. That is without a doubt. And I, I'm going to make you another guarantee. This is probably the only guarantee that I'll make you throughout the course of this program. When you first quit a substance, something bad is going to come up because of the fact that you are alive and you are living life. We can't have good if we don't have bad. We can't have uh, gloomy days if we don't have sunny days. We don't know what pleasure is if we haven't experienced pain. Good and bad, yin and yang, th this is what makes life life. And I promise a challenging situation is going to come up within the first two weeks of you quitting. It might be something as stupid as stubbing your toe. It might be something bigger and more monumental in your life. But you're going to face a challenge. And I just want you to be aware of that. We're going to talk about how you can handle it without drugs. But I want you to be aware because it's a guarantee that it's going to happen. And when it does happen, this is a monumental moment in your addiction recovery because it's how you handle that situation that's going to largely determine how the sobriety and recovery process looks for you, okay? Quitting is what provides you with an opportunity to create something new. Quitting is inherently how we're going to learn all these new tools, all these new traits, all these new things that are going to propel our life forward. Quitting creates space. It frees up energy. Quitting frees up time. Quitting frees up our physical health. It gives us an opportunity to pursue something new. And you wouldn't be watching this if you weren't sick and tired of what it is ever you have been doing for the last several years. Weed, nicotine, porn, whatever it may be. The reality is this might suck. This might be hard for some people, not for everyone, it won't for everyone, but for some people it might be. And I just want to remind you that addiction sucks too. It's Quitting sucks. Withdrawal suck. It's not fun. No matter what mindset I'm going to give you, and I'm going to give you some really good ones to get through withdrawals, there's no way around that. That's reality, okay? But being addicted sucks. Being stuck in the same place that you're in day in and day out, day after day, not changing sucks. Addiction creates the most uncomfortable of comfort zones, and it's time for you to leave that comfort zone. It's time for you to actually get uncomfortable, and this is the perfect opportunity to do so. People talk, okay, people talk about running marathons and doing triathlons and putting themselves in intentionally challenging situations. They talk about this a lot in the book, The Comfort Crisis. I'll link that in the video description. This is your challenge. This is your opportunity for growth, okay? I don't know if you're familiar with this, but most growth comes from discomfort. I could go back all the way to the time you were born as a child and you went through growing pains. Physically, as your bones were growing, it was uncomfortable. You wouldn't remember that because you were a baby, just like I don't remember that. Growth comes through discomfort, period. There's no way around that. Now, all of that being said, I promise it gets better. Guys, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't have remained sober if it got better. If life didn't eventually get better, I would have went back to using drugs. I would have had no qualms with doing so. Okay. Here's my second model for you guys. It is what it is. I would encourage you to drop any expectations that you have when it comes to quitting. So many people go into quitting watching videos like mine on YouTube. I have over 900 of them are dedicated to quitting. They read Reddit forms. They go on Facebook. They search on TikTok and they hear about someone else's experience. And one of two things happen. One, they, they read about someone quitting weed and it sounds horrific and they get so scared, so manipulated by addiction, they don't even attempt to quit. That's one possibility. Possibility number two is that you read about someone who had a very good experience quitting, a very easy experience quitting. They quit, they detoxed in four to five days, and they felt great within two weeks. Then what happens? It takes you longer than two weeks. It takes you three months to start feeling good again. Maybe it's like me. Maybe it takes you a full year to really get back up on your feet. 
and, and what occurs is you see this, you read about it, and you say, wait, I got through the first five days. Why don't I feel better? That YouTube video, that Reddit post said all the nicotine, all the weed was out of my body. Why don't I feel good? You freak out. You think that you're unique. You think that you're the exception to the rule and that now you suddenly can't quit, that you're incapable of it. I fell for each of these mentalities many, many times. If you go into this with the mentality of it is what it is, how I feel is how I feel, and irregardless of that, I'm going to see this commitment, this decision through, I promise you it's going to make this process a thousand times easier, and it's going to help to ease your mind. Because if you're not seeking from outside sources of validation for your journey, for what you're going through, if you can drop that, this becomes a lot easier. So please, it is what it is. That's the mantra. That's the motto for the first 90 days, okay? Day one, start to figure out what is it that you're going to quit? What is it that you're looking at limiting or giving up as a whole? Is it nicotine? Is it weed? Is it caffeine? Is it alcohol? Is it sugar? Is it adult media content? I recommend starting with the thing that's causing you the most grief. So if you've tried quitting them all at once before, and that was too monumental of a task to take on, which in many cases it can be for people, and we'll talk about why that might be later. Pick the thing that's causing the biggest problem. If you're watching this video, chances are it's weed. I can tell you from years of coaching people, from personal experience, when we see people drop cannabis, motivation goes up, physical health goes up, mental health improves, right? They're working out now. They're doing things differently now to get a little more money in their bank account. And suddenly as life improves, then they say, you know what? Now I want to start eating healthier. Now I want to drop nicotine. Now I want to drop alcohol. I, I never had a problem with alcohol. It was never an issue for me. I would drink casually on the weekends, not even every weekend. It took me years after I quit smoking weed to quit alcohol. And I say quit alcohol, I mean stop drinking. I didn't necessarily have to quit. I just made that decision to stop drinking. I did that years after because alcohol for me, although one of the most toxic things out there, wasn't my main issue. It wasn't the thing currently destroying my life. Sure as hell wasn't helping, but it wasn't destroying it. If you're quitting more than one thing at once, there's some advantages. If you drop it all together, you're going to go through one set of withdrawals. Okay, That's one positive. You're done with all of it. You don't have to worry about it. It's a true dopamine fast. By dropping everything, you're going to give your brain a chance to reset its dopamine levels. Dr. Anna Lemke discusses dopamine fasting in detail in her book. Dr. Andrew Huberman also has a pretty, really good podcast on dopamine fasting. The other advantage to this is you're not going to risk trading one substance for another substance. So this is, I'm going to quit weed, but I'm not going to quit adult media content. I'm going to quit weed, but I'm not going to quit gambling. And then suddenly you find yourself quitting weed, but now you're gambling more or now you're drinking more alcohol. It does not have to be that way. It doesn't have to be. So there's some benefits to dropping everything at once. Now, there's also some negatives that I want you to be aware of. Uh, then the withdrawal might be too intense. That dopamine crash might be too much. You might experience some anhedonia, some depression because of the circumstances of the chemicals that are occurring in your brain because of substances, okay? Might be too much. Um, you might be overwhelmed and revert to other substances. And this is probably one of the biggest flaws that I see when people quit everything at once, it's usually driven by motivation instead of determination. Determination, and I should say discipline. It's cool to quit smoking weed. You're going to be pumped up after you watch this. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get my life back. I'm going to change. I'm going to have more money. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to quit eating sugar. I'm going to put down the adult media content. You're motivated. But motivation eventually fades. And when motivation fades, we need to be able to rely on discipline and determination. So if you are quitting everything at once, please make sure or at least acknowledge that a large part of that momentum is driven by motivation and we eventually have to shift that mindset as we're going through the quit. And we'll talk about that later on. This is 
the once you determine what it is you're quitting, the next most important thing is to ask yourself why. Why are you quitting? Why are you doing this? That's that's so important. Um there's going to be a series of reasons that you come up with. I recommend at least finding a minimum of seven reasons, seven reasons minimum. Okay. Eight, seven, 10, it doesn't matter. Be, a lot of people are going to say, I'm quitting smoking weed because, uh, you know, my men, I, I'm depressed because I'm anxious. Okay. And they're going to say, you know, I don't like my physical health. They're going to say, I don't have money. They're going to say my relationship, it's holding me back from my potential. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of my energy. Two of the most valuable resources we have in life, time and energy. You can't get anything without time and energy. Okay. That's what a lot of people are going to say. So figure out why you want to quit. Write that down. Pause this if you have to, because this is very important. The next step is I want you to identify why do you smoke weed? Why do you continue to consume the substance? Okay. Now, a lot of people are going to say to me, oh, because I'm depressed, because I'm anxious about you know this relationship with my girlfriend, because I don't have a lot of money and I'm, I'm depressed by that, because of the stress at work. That's a big one I get when I'm working with entrepreneurs because of the stress of my family, the stress of kids, the stress of life. It helps me with stress. Okay. So why do you smoke? Because it helps me relax because it's fun socially. Now, here's what I want you to do. Okay. I want you to look at those two lists and I want you to see where it doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense. You're telling me you want to quit because you're stressed about the money you're spending on weed and what it's done to your mental health and your physical health and that it's robbed you of your time and energy. But then you're telling me that you smoke because you have no time because work is too stressful, that, 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 you, uh, that you smoke because you're, you're, you're stressed out from the kids and the family, okay? That you smoke because you're depressed about the way that your body looks or the situation that you're in. Well, is we not potentially putting you in those exact circumstances? This is where we start to see the thing that's causing the problem. We're treating that thing as the solution to the problem. And this is inherently wrong. It's irrational. Okay. Addiction is irrational. Okay. I'm trying to just show you guys the facade, the delusion that it creates. Because once you can see through that, quitting becomes significantly easier. Once you realize someone's been lying to you, once you realize it's all BS, it becomes so much easier to cut that person off when you're no longer being manipulated by them. That's exactly what addiction is. So look at those two lists and I challenge you to make it make sense to me. Drop a comment below and make it make sense. Why are you trying, why are you using weed to help with your anxiety when weed is taking away your energy and your time that you could be putting towards bettering yourself that could truly be improving your anxiety or the depression or whatever the situation is? Make it make sense. You can't because addiction is irrational. And this is a breakthrough when it comes to quitting. Quitting a substance is not about what you give up. It's about everything that you're going to gain back in life. Your time, your energy, your focus, your motivation, the relationships, the faith, the physical health, the mental health, the finances. This has nothing to do with what you're giving up. And if you view quitting weed, quitting smoking, quitting gambling, quitting porn is what you're giving up, you're putting your brain in a state of deprivation, okay? And if you feel like you're depriving yourself of something, this is going to hurt. But if you recognize that this has nothing to do with deprivation, this is about what you are gaining back in life. I promise you, you, your chances at success are going to be significantly higher. And we're going to talk a little bit at the end of this about what defines success in, in, in recovery, okay? Because that's very important as well too. Day one, equally important to figuring out why you want to quit, figuring out why it is that you smoke, figuring out the substances that you're choosing to quit is what are the things that you're going to pursue, Okay, because when we quit smoking weed, we're getting back two very valuable resources, time and energy. Where are you going to put that time and energy? 
Is it going to be into exercise? Is it going to be into reading? Is it going to be into work? Is it in relationships? Is it into fixing your nutrition? Is it into better sleep patterns? Is it into cold showers, running, yoga, fitness, faith? Where are you going to put this abundance of time and energy that you have? Idle hands and an idle mind make for trouble, especially for someone who suffers from that addiction mindset. And I'm not going to say suffers because really it can be a blessing if you get it right, if you learn how to tame it and use it correctly. You have the ability to completely transform your life. And I'm saying that as a testimonial. I've done it myself. You can look at the YouTube channel. You can look at the comments. You can look at all the lives that have been positively impacted by this movement that this community has created. So I'm not talking out of out of out of uh out of my blowhole here okay what are you going to pursue just identify a few things you don't have to ferociously attack them right away and i actually advise that you don't in the beginning but i do want you to identify them this this is a a master class on addiction the next uh you know hour of your life and if you watch parts 2 and 3 that I'll be dropping soon which I'll have linked in the pinned comment once they're up in the video description that that that's what this is breaking an addiction is about pursuing your ambition okay we break addiction to pursue ambition Everyone watching this is, is highly ambitious. I don't think you're lazy. I don't think you're a burnout. I don't think you're any of those things that people typically associate with addiction. You have been very ambitious in your addiction, in your behaviors, okay? I need you to reapply that addiction mindset. I need you to take that mentality. I need you to take that ambition and create a better life for yourself a better life for the people around you, a better life for your family. That's a, a, a better life. And how do you do that? You, you, you change your behavior and you pursue the things in life that you care about and you let go of the things that are wasting your time, your energy, your mental health, your physical health. You drop those things. Getting sober is the first step. Because none of that stuff is going to happen for a lot of people watching this without sobriety. You might, you might have already achieved some of those things despite addiction, but getting sober is often step one. Don't neglect this step. I spent years trying to improve my life. I'd pay for business coaching. I'd go to therapy. I'd do this. I'd do that. I spent years trying to improve my life without taking the first step, and that was getting rid of the drugs. You are capable of so much more than you think, and I would reckon to believe that you have quite possibly forgot that. Addiction wants you to forget what it is you are capable of. That's what gives addiction its power, okay? Addiction thrives on that in which it creates, which is our misery. That is food. That is fuel for addiction. What's the death of addiction? Growth ambition, self-worth. This is the death. These are the things that that's the sword that you use to kill an addiction. Reframing your mindset. It's telling your brain, no, it's as simple as saying, stop. I don't need that right now. No, that's not for me. And I, I understand in some addictions and some substances, in some cases, I'm oversimplifying that. I understand the necessity for medical detox. And even in some cases, a medicated detox. I get that. Okay. It's rare, but I get it. Okay. Um, it's telling yourself, no, it people, people call me and I'm at flaw for this. I'm, this is my fault. I say, I'm going to give you the tools that you need to get sober. I'm going to give you the thing. And that's, that's, that's wrong. I should, I should, I should, uh, ding myself on false advertising. You develop the tools by going through the challenging experience. I can give you some guidance on it. I can get you you're amped up. I, I, can, I can keep you accountable. But the tools develop by going through the experience. I got the tools that I'm teaching you guys by getting sober. How do you get the tools to build a business? Who teaches people how to build a business? People who have built businesses, people who have gone through the experience. If, if someone's teaching how to build a business and they haven't built one themselves, they don't, got, they don't got it, right? Does that make sense? Now, here's the good news. You already have all of the tools. You have all of them. 
You have discipline. You have grit. You have dedication. You have obsession. You have commitment. You even have accountability, right? You've been so accountable to this drug. You've been so disciplined in your use. You have gotten up grit, one of the number one successful defining factors in an individual. You have tried to quit a thousand times and you keep coming back. Despite getting knocked down, you are still standing. You have every single trait that you need. The exact traits that put you in the situation you're in are the exact traits that are already within you that are going to pull you out of this. Okay? I'm not going to give them to you. No one is. They're in inside of you. I just need you to extract them and apply them. And that's exactly what we're talking about doing today. We're talking about how for how freeing your mind from the substance will allow you to do that. Reframe your mindset. I said this in the beginning. It's been broken down. It's broke. Addiction broke it, but it's fixable. It's malleable. Motivation will not work. For two primary reasons. Reason number one, when the withdrawals hit, people get really motivated. They get kind of in this state of pink cloud. Oh, I'm feeling good. I quit smoking weed. Life goes on. Okay. Then then they get withdrawals at day five, day 14. Maybe it's post-acute withdrawal symptoms. Day 30. Who knows? And suddenly the motivation's gone. Boom. I got punched in the face. Don't want to do this anymore. It was easy at first. Now it got hard. I'm not motivated. See ya. Okay. Motivation fades. Problem number two, when the good times hit, when you start to achieve the things that you set out to achieve, motivation is going to fail you. Okay. I'm six. I'm 30 days sober from weed. I'm 90 days sober. The drug is out of my body. I'm feeling good physically, mentally. My relationships look great. Life is good. Motivation to quit smoking weed and stay off weed is now gone. Now what? Now what happens when that random infrequent craving strikes a year later maybe, maybe two years later? I don't get cravings for weed anymore. Alcohol, though, I haven't drank in about two years now. I still still might get a random one, and I wasn't even addicted to that. So how do you not drink? Am I motivated to not have a drink in that moment? No, it's discipline. It's a shift in mindset. How do you strengthen discipline? You continually practice it. You pick something to be disciplined in. I picked sobriety. I treat sobriety as a discipline. And I practice it over and over and over and over. And I look forward to opportunities that are going to make me exercise my discipline because that's an opportunity for me to strengthen it. You made a promise to yourself Keep that promise, okay? You're eventually going to find out what the reward is. There is a reward at the end of this. I don't know what it is for you. For me, it turned out to be being able to give back this beautiful platform to the world, okay? I don't know what your reward is going to be, but we're going to find out if you stick with it. Keep that promise you made to yourself. So important, so vital when it comes to addiction you're, you probably have a whole host of excuses if you're anything like me. Parents are divorced, trauma in my background, things still aren't good, money isn't right, business is booming, I can't manage the stress, uh, I went through this tragedy. There's a number of reasons why you can't quit, okay? And all of those reasons are probably valid, okay? So what? Just because you found a valid excuse, a valid reason as to why you can't stop using this drug, does that mean you want to continue living your life exactly the way you are right now as you're watching this video? So what? Yeah, that's a good reason why. Yeah, a lot of my family circumstances still are very, very not good. Okay, now fortunately I have a beautiful life, I have a child, I have a wife, but I have things that are still struggle. So what? Does that mean I'm going to go back to what I was doing? Does that mean that you should maintain what you're doing? Of course not. We all have valid excuses, but that doesn't mean that we need to give validity. That doesn't mean that we need to fall victim to them. That's, that's what I'm looking to say. Okay? We have to break that. Addiction recovery is much like climbing a mountain. Quitting happens overnight. People, how do I quit smoking? Don't pick up another cigarette. How do I quit weed? 
Don't go to the dispensary. Don't text your plug. It happens in an instant. It does not have to be a long, drawn-out thing. If you don't believe me, the book Rational Recovery, highly recommend reading it because it will totally change your view on that. But it is like climbing a mountain because you are going to go through a series of events or circumstances or challenges along the way. How long does it really take to quit? I think it's about a year. Not saying that you're going to struggle with withdrawals for a year, that you're going to have cravings for a year. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Don't let that addicted voice manipulate what I'm saying when I say a year. You, the, the point of, of a discipline, the discipline of sobriety, is to apply that discipline in different life scenarios. So it's a year to go through all four seasons here in New York, if you're from New York. Got to learn how to get through winter sober. Got to learn how to get through summer sober, winter when you're depressed, summer when you're happy, right? Got to learn how to navigate that. Got to learn how to get through the holidays sober. Got to learn how to get through the breakup sober. Got to learn how to get through the funeral sober, right? It's about a year, I think, for most people to go through various events that life throws at us, good and bad. You got to learn how to celebrate that business win sober, okay? So it's like climbing a mountain. Quitting happens overnight. How do you stay that way? You you practice the discipline. Uh, Withdrawal, this will be determined, and we're going to talk about it in in just a little bit in the next portion of this. I'm actually doing an hour of recording straight through. I was going to break this up, but I'm just going to record straight through. Uh, We'll talk about withdrawal more in a minute. You don't ever need to go back. All of this pain, all of this suffering, you can stop it right now. Right now, you don't ever need to go back to the substance unless you choose to, unless you choose to go back, unless you consciously make that effort to spark another joint, to plug another bong, to take another hit off of that dab pen. You don't ever need to face this again. Now, you're going to have a new set of challenges when you quit, right? You're going to go, you, you might go through withdrawal. You might have to go to that birthday party sober. You might have to go through that loss of, of, of life from a loved one sober, you're going to have other challenges. But this challenge, this one right now, this challenge that adds no value to your life, no inherent value, you can be 100% done with today. I didn't say it was going to be easy. You know, I used to recommend the book The Easy Way in all of my videos, which is a great book for helping to realize that there's really not the benefit that we think there is affiliated with smoking. But I also think that book in some instances, in some rare instances, does a disservice to people because it makes you think it's going to be easy. And what about the people who it's not easy for? What about the people that have tried to quit a thousand times, they read the book, and now it's going to take them 10 more times? I don't want to lie to people. Want to feel good? Stop doing the things that make you feel bad. This was one of the most valuable pieces of advice that I ever got from any type of therapy. And it was the most straightforward. Frank, you want to feel better? Stop doing things that make you feel bad. Don't spend your money like an idiot. Don't pick up that drug. Don't drink alcohol. You said all those things make you feel bad, right? That's what you're doing here. If you want to feel better, you are entitled to feeling better. Okay? You are entitled to that if you make the choice to. Otherwise, Otherwise, you're going to go through life blaming others, blaming outside circumstances and outside scenarios on the way you feel. And if that's how you choose to live your life, you are going to be blown like a feather in the wind, just victim to the next thing, the next thing that happens to you. That's not how I want to live. That's not how I want to see you guys live. If the drug made you feel good, you wouldn't be here. If the drug satisfied the cravings, you wouldn't be left feeling so empty. That's what addiction is. It's a numbness. It's an emptiness. Arguably one of the worst emotions to experience. And trust me, numb is a feeling because you're conscious that you're numb. That's a feeling. That's a realization. And it's one of the worst. Some tips and tricks as you approach day one before we jump jump into the withdrawal portion of this. Focus on trying to get sleep. Get sleep. Regulate your sleep the best you can. We'll talk about insomnia. Focus on light exercise, something that should make you feel good. Focus on the things in your life that you can control and those in which you can't. 
let go of for now. We can revisit them, but let go. There's no point in getting worked up about the news when you can't control what's going on in politics. When you're, Unless you're going to fight in a war somewhere and you're upset about a war, don't get upset about it. You can't control it. Okay? Focus on eating fruit. Fruit is a great food to eat. It's easy on the stomach. Stay hydrated. Watch videos, but don't compare. If you need to join a social circle, I highly recommend our addiction mindset community over any other community out there. Okay? Um, it's involved enough, but it's not overly involved or overly demanding. And we don't really have a lot of expectations in there because your journey's your journey. That's how we view it. But accountability can help. So if you need a group, join that pin comment video description, sauna, yoga, cold showers, find a new reward, find something that gives you purpose. This is one of the most important things. If you already have things in life that give you purpose, get reinvested in those things. If it's a family, if it's a business, if it's if it's um, a side hustle, if it's a hobby, and you already have it, and you're you're still suffering from addiction, get reinvested into it. That's that's thing number one. Okay. Thing number two, if you don't have a purpose, quit doing drugs to allow yourself the opportunity to find one. It was through the boredom. It was through the stopping using substances, through the gain of time and energy that I eventually picked up a camera and a microphone and started to find another purpose in my life, a purpose that has allowed me to give more to the other things that are purposeful, family, friends, this, that. You need a purpose, Okay, and you need a purpose that you can be invested in. This is very important. And this is particularly hard, in my opinion, for young men and young women in that phase of like college, between like college and working, or between like high school and career, because you don't really fully have a purpose. You might not have like a great family or have your own family like that you started. And and like it's just a weird time, but you got to find a purpose. Supplements. Let's talk about it. There's two great supplements out there. N-acetylcysteine, ashwagandha. N-acetylcysteine helps to promote, uh, helps to temporarily reduce oral cravings. Ashwagandha KSM-66 has been shown to reduce stress. It's a patented form of the herb. It has clinical studies on it to reduce stress. These are great things that can help. Supplements are supplemental to the mindset. Just like working out, people think they're going to take a weight loss supplement and that they're going to lose weight. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. The supplements are supplemental to the mindset and the lifestyle modifications that we're talking about making, period. That is the answer. The answer comes from within, not from some outside thing. So don't fall for it. Now, I am a fan of supplements. I believe in these supplements heavily. And here at Addiction Mindset, we have created, I have spent two years creating a supplement. I promise you, nothing like this exists on the market. You cannot find this anywhere else. It does not exist. I called three manufacturing facilities around the world to develop this product. Okay. And it's not released yet. If you want to, to be on a, a wait list to learn more about this. When you check the pinned comment, scroll down in the links in my stand store in my link tree, and you're going to find a place where you can join the wait list to learn about when this supplement's released. We're releasing it probably about four to six weeks from now uh, once it gets clearance through FDA and customs and stuff like that. Next, the high performance planner. Day one of quitting, I would recommend having this on hand right from the get-go. This is a planner that I use, and it allows you to keep track of your progress. And I think momentum builds on momentum. If you can watch yourself making progress, gaining momentum, and then score it and rate it, objectively see that you are doing better. Not just so your family's telling you, hey, you're doing better since you quit smoking, because you might not feel like you are. When you can objectively see that, it makes a significant difference. So I would highly recommend checking out the High Performance Planner. This is an excellent book. Again, you can find it in the pinned comment or the video description. The video description. We also have our accountability community. If you need support, we have a group. 
We have weekly challenges. We have monthly meetings. We have wins and losses that we talk about. And then there's tons of other video links and resources when it comes to quitting weed and business and motivation and building discipline and stoicism. I, I've just done a big remodel on that community. I'm in the process of doing a huge remodel on it. And I would highly encourage you guys to check it out if this is something you want help with. Lastly, your brain needs simplicity, okay? Taking drugs is actually relatively simple. The brain craves simplicity. It's much easier to do the easy thing than it is to do the hard thing. That's why so many of us fall victim to substance use. Now, when you first quit, your brain is in a million directions. It's just been fried, okay? You had years of addiction, months of addiction, decades of addiction. Now you stopped doing that thing that you've become physically and psychologically dependent upon. Okay. Now, what are you going to do? Get a routine, get a very, very simple routine laid out for yourself. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to develop a plan. Okay. So this could be exercising in the mornings, journaling in the evenings. It could just be literally waking up and working. Like if you're broke, and you don't have money because of addiction, your routine should be staying sober and figuring out how you're going to provide value to drive an income for yourself, period. There should be nothing else in your routine, okay? Um, if, if you're really out of shape, maybe your routine is getting back into better physical shape. If you're disconnected from your family, maybe part of your routine is getting reconnected with your family, with your kids, with your wife, with your husband, Okay. Develop a simple routine that you can stick through. Stick through. And I say a rough routine or a simple routine because the only thing that matters, I, I don't want you to develop a routine and then think to yourself, okay, I have to work out three times a week and I have to do a cold shower twice a day and I have to, you know, um, a, a meal prep every day. The only thing you have to do is not use drugs, minimally for the first 90 days. If you've accomplished that, I'm, I, we're happy. But in an ideal world, you start to develop some other aspects of a routine. I want to share with you guys my general routine and how it works. Okay. Sunday, no, Monday is Monday and Tuesday are days where I build up motivation. If I'm reading books, they're motivational. If I'm watching videos, they're motivational. It's, it's getting myself amped up for the week. Now, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm predominantly learning a new skill. So this is where I'm learning about YouTube video editing. I'm learning about how to grow my chiropractic practice. I'm learning something. I'm educating myself. Friday, Saturday, Sunday intentionally are chosen for implementation. I'm now taking the motivation. I'm taking the education and I'm applying implementation. I'm acting out. I'm taking action on all the things that I said I was going to take action on, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, intentionally doing that when the rest of the world isn't, okay? That has now created a lot of separation between me and a lot of people in, a, in, 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 my, in my sense in a very positive way. That's a loose routine, okay? So think of a loose routine for you guys. I want to welcome you, if you're new to the channel, to the community. Addiction thrives on that, which, on that in which it creates, which is misery. We're getting away from that. This community is not about misery. We're not going to sit here and talk about, oh, that time I smoked and, oh, what it could have been and, oh, the old timers that, oh, God, I just remember smoking weed and it was, we're not doing that. This is future focused. This is forward focus. You got problems. We're going to figure them out. We're going to find solutions and we're going to move on. Every problem has a solution and that is damn good news. And that includes addiction. Okay. They say there's no cure for addiction. The, the, the cure is right here. It's right here. It's just the spectrum of addiction and to how convoluted and how rotted someone's brain has become from the substance varies. Okay. And maybe in some cases it is too far gone, sadly. That, that is a reality. Q&A question on part one. Should I quit on vacation? These are common questions that I get when, when people are talking to me. Should I quit on vacation? Okay. 
there's some advantage to this. If you have to remove yourself from your environment, if your work is insane and you need a break, now's a good time to go take a break. Okay. Yeah. It might make the first two weeks a little bit easier. I'm going to caution you though. And this is a big word of caution. Okay. If you quit on vacation or even going to rehab, which I'm not opposed to, you're out of your element. You're out of your reality. You're eventually going to come back to reality. And when reality hits, it's going to hit very differently than that vacation to the Bahamas hit, than that cruise that you decided to book hit. It's going to hit very, very differently. So I think there's some advantages to going away when it comes to irritability and withdrawal, but there's also setbacks. The biggest setback being you're not quitting in real time. You're not quitting in your current circumstances. And the purpose of getting sober is not to run from your life. It's to figure out how to manage it, how to deal with it appropriately and maturely. So vacation's good. Make sure you're not running from your addiction though, because I promise you it will eventually catch you again. You can't run from this. You can't hide from this. Should I wean off slowly? In some cases, this may be beneficial. They're rare, but they can happen. If uh, you quit nicotine and you get seizures, which is rare, but I, I've seen it now with the high intense milligrams of vapes. Um, okay. We're not going to just quit and get a seizure. That would be counterproductive. We got to figure out how to wean off slowly. If you're quitting weed, yeah, weaning off slowly in some rare circumstances might be necessary because of heart rate irregularities. Although I would argue that CBD and some of the other endocannabinoids could probably offset that. And there's a lot of supplements out there to offset that. And I would tell you that if you're working with a physician, if that happens, which you should, they could probably prescribe you a beta blocker for a week or two or a month. And that should take care of it. And then you can get off that and be fine. So there's some instances where now, of course, if you're going through severe alcoholism, if you're going through benzo withdrawal, some of these things can be life threatening and working in a detox facility is advised. Now, what about moderation? I, I get this so often all the time on my channel. I am sorry to all those that comment that say, Dr. Frank, why don't you just moderate weed? Why don't you moderate? Moderation is king. I am sorry that you choose to live a moderate life and that I don't. I don't practice moderation in nearly anything that I do. I never did. If it was smoking weed, I wasn't going to be moderate. If it was nicotine, I had to dip. I had to chew. I had to smoke cigarettes. I had to vape. I had to do all of it. A lot of people who resonate with my content are not moderate people. And the sooner that I realized that about myself, the sooner I could start living in my own skin, the sooner I realized that I was not ever going to be a moderate person, the sooner my self-worth started to increase. Also my net worth. This is moderation. Why would I spend my life trying to moderate something that I no longer want to be doing, something that gives me inherently no value anymore, when I could be out there expanding on all the things in my life that I care about, all the things that bring me value, all the things in my life that matter, why would I want to practice moderation of something that I no longer have an interest in? I wouldn't. And I'm sorry, a moderate life to me is an extremely boring life. It's not for me. If it's for you, all the power to you. So there's my take on moderation. I get this all the time. Dr. Frank, what if I get this? What if I get cravings? What if I get withdrawals? What if I get anxious? What if I get into an argument? What if I lose my job? Yes. Yes. I told you on the first slide, things are going to happen. We all have a what if. We all have a what if. We all have a valid excuse. Okay. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to continue to live the rest of my life the way that I'm living it. What if you have to figure it out? I have over 800 videos on here about almost every category that you could possibly imagine. Every what if has been answered in one way, shape, or form by people who have successfully quit before. Find the answer to it and get through it, period. That's it. My favorite question. I will make an hour-long video or longer 
And I will get a DM that says, how do I quit smoking weed? You quit smoking weed by working on becoming the person that you want to become. And that is exactly what all this is about. There is a level of cognitive dissonance between you and your addiction. That is what makes addiction so painful. Contrary to popular belief, yes, there's the physical plane. Yes, you might get cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Yeah, you might get psychosis. That's really bad. Psychosis excludes some of the things that we talked about today because that person, their mind is broken temporarily. So a lot of this won't even apply. So psychosis is the only caveat. But um, uh, uh, how do I quit smoking weed? You quit smoking weed by building the life that you want to be living, a life that you want your family to be living, a life that you can be truly proud of and truly enjoy. What steps do you need to take to become that person? What things do you need to get rid of to become that person. That's how you quit smoking weed. How do you quit smoking weed? It's a one sentence answer. You stop smoking weed. You don't pick up the drug. You don't light the spliff. You don't hit the vaporizer. You don't buy the dab pen. You don't go to the dispensary. It happens in an instant. It's how do I build a better life? That's the question that we're trying to answer. And you build a better life with the exact same mindset, that addiction mindset that got you into the situation that you're in right now where you, while you're watching this video. Okay? That's that's how. That's how this works. That's how this happens. All right. Let's jump on to part two. Okay. Let's talk about withdrawal because a lot of people are going to face withdrawal when they first quit smoking weed. And I want to make sure that we cover this in detail. I want you to keep one motto in mind when it comes to withdrawal. You are winning. If you're suffering from withdrawal, you are winning. You are beating this addiction, period. That's If you know nothing else about withdrawal, know that. Now, here's the motto for today. I am the greatest, said Muhammad Ali. You have to get up every morning and tell yourself, I can do this. And if you don't think you can, then it's your responsibility to find a resource or to talk to someone or to do something to psych yourself up. I wake up plenty of days of the week because maybe I'm tired. Maybe I was up late working on something. Maybe I was up with the kid where I am not motivated to do something, where where I am tired and I don't feel like it. But I tell myself, Frank, come on, snap out of it, man. You got this. You can do this. And if I really need some help, I throw on some motivational content. I go for a walk. I go for a run. I lift some weights. I do something to get myself into a position of being ready to take on the day. If you wake up and you roll out of bed and you you hit nicotine, you have a drink of alcohol, you you, you watch pornography, you, you smoke weed, you're not preparing yourself physically or mentally for the battleground that you might be up against, which might be withdrawals. You have to prepare yourself for it. You have to be ready. It's your responsibility to do so. Okay? I don't care how you do it. Watch my videos. There's a lot of them on here. Let's talk about what withdrawal actually is because it's through education that we can get to implementation. Implementation being quitting, education, understanding what the body's going through. Uh, It's an imbalance of dopamine. Uh, Contrary to popular belief, most people think, oh, I smoke weed, I do drugs, whatever, I have a lot of dopamine. No. The more drugs you do, the greater the dopamine deficit that occurs in your brain. This eventually results in something called anhedonia. This is a lack of joy in life, a lack of pursuit in life, a lack of motivation in life. Addiction creates this because addiction is not a hit of pleasure. It's not a hit of dopamine, okay? it Temporarily it is, but big picture, it drops our dopamine levels. Now that's happening, so you got to deal with that. What else is happening? Realistically, withdrawal, okay, withdrawal is detox. It's a healing process. When you're going through weed withdrawal, it's your body detoxing and healing. It's your body doing exactly what you want it to be doing. It is a sign that your liver works, that your kidneys work, that your central nervous system works, okay? 
Your body's warning you, don't do this again. Don't put me through this again. I hope you remember that. Write that down when you're going through withdrawal. I don't ever want to go through this again. It's one, your body warning you. And two, it's your body showing you that it's working hard to get you better. Again, back to physiology, when you quit smoking weed, it's an imbalance of your endocannabinoid system. When you smoke weed, you get THC, which is a phytocannabinoid, okay? And it's, it's an external source of, of cannabinoids from a plant. Your body will eventually stop making its own endocannabinoids when you consume a lot of THC. This system is a master regulator. And this drives me nuts when people say, oh, I can't get physically addicted to weed. How can you not get physically addicted to weed when this system, your endocannabinoid system, plays a role in, in regulating everything, bone growth, hormone production, uh, emotional responses to things, appetite, sleep regulation, digestive health, you have more endocannabinoid sister, endo ECS receptors in your gut than you do almost anywhere else on your body. It's on your skin. This is why cannabis impacts almost every system in our body. This is why when some people quit after years of heavy use, every system in their body feels it physically. Drives me nuts when people say that. It's such a myth. It's such a false statement okay, that you can only get psychologically addicted to cannabis. And it's a dangerous statement. And I, I fell for it. I see, I see teenagers falling for it in the high schools every day. I see physicians falling for it every day with the prescription of medical cannabis, right? Such a false statement. An imbalance of adrenaline and norepinephrine. If particularly if you're quitting weed, um, you're you're going to experience this imbalance or, or nicotine. You're going to experience this even more. But when you quit, you're going to get cravings. Cravings are a fight or flight response. Cravings is a, a a state, a physical state of being that's creating a stress response that's dumping adrenaline, norepinephrine, to make you go take action. And if you're still under the manipulation of addiction, that action is going to be getting another drug, getting more drugs. Okay, so, so understand as you're going through this detox and this healing process, you're also experiencing all these other fluctuations. This is also why you might be so quick and so irritable to snap at people as you're fighting cravings, as you're quitting because of these spikes in adrenaline, norepinephrine. But if you know what's going on, you can start to figure out how to combat this. Simple. How do I increase dopamine naturally? How do I manage my stress response? How do I balance my nervous system? How do I heal my endocannabinoid system? All things that you could take action and Google right after watching this today, but we're going to talk about some of those things. This is taking action for your recovery and your sobriety. This is what thinking clearly leads you to solutions about dopamine. I said this earlier, uh, addiction is a dopamine deficit. It leads to a state of anhedonia, a lack of joy in life, a lack of motivation. These drugs are not giving you dopamine, but I will say this. When you quit, you're going to drop even a little more in dopamine before it rebalances. And you are probably going to have a period of time where you wind up with withdrawal symptoms. Dopamine is largely what's responsible for feeling those withdrawal symptoms. Your body wants more dopamine and it doesn't know where to get it from because it just stopped the drug. In time, this will heal. Just be aware of that's what's going on. Now, as Dr. Anna Lemke's book explained that I said in the beginning of this, as, as you push into the pain, eventually your body's going to say, hey, wait a minute, this is painful and it's going to rebalance it out with pleasure. Now, there's, there, there, there are instances where people have abused substances enough over the course of years and quantities that this system might be broken. And in those cases, if you've quit for a while, you put in all the work and you're still just feeling awful, um, you might want to consider like a Wellbutrin or talking to your doctor about a dopamine stimulating uh, substance. Uh, you know, personally, I can't make recommendations. I've seen uh, Adderall go very poorly for people. Just a heads up, your stimulant-based drugs, I've seen it go really bad. Um, but I, I have seen like Wellbutrin and stuff like that go better in some cases. And no, we're not trying to trade one drug for another drug. I'm talking to people who are like a year sober, they did everything in the world and they feel like crap. 
that that shouldn't be. Um, let's talk about withdrawal. W fear. I talked about this in the first presentation. So many people uh, will spend years addicted to a drug because they are afraid of quitting smoking weed because of the withdrawals. They're afraid of quitting alcohol because of the withdrawals. Fear, one of my favorite quotes, is often nothing more than false expectations appearing real. What's going to apply to you doesn't necessarily apply to someone else. And what applied to someone else might not apply to you. It's fear. An addiction is a master manipulator of fear. It makes you fearful of what's going to happen if you quit. What's life going to look like if you stop doing the drug, right? But then on the flip side of that, there's the fear of what's my life going to look like if I keep doing drugs? What's my life going to look like if I keep this behavior? There's fear on both sides of the withdrawals and understanding it, seeing it for what it is, false expectations appearing real makes quitting a lot easier. We're breaking down the facade of addiction. What does weed withdrawal look like? In, in more extreme circumstances, this is typically what we see, excluding cases involving psychosis or cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which are their own things. Insomnia, irritability, fatigue, flu-like symptoms, muscle aches, cravings, nausea, stomach pain, IBS, sweating, heart rate changes, sadness, I don't even want to say depression, body temperature, dysregulation. There's a bunch of stuff that can happen when you quit weed because it's responsible for the regulation of your endocannabinoid system. My advice, treat it like having the flu. Whether you're on vacation, whether you're at home quitting, pretend like you have the flu for the first two weeks. You want to take it easy. I want you to attack your goals. I want you to attack your fitness. I want you to get better. But in order to get better, you need some rest. Your body, when I go back here and I talk about fatigue, why am I so fatigued when I quit a drug? Your body is going through an active state of detox and withdrawal. Every system in your body is working overtime to get you better because your body loves you because your body wants you to do well. So you're tired. So don't expect to go to work and be a top performer in the first two weeks of quitting. Don't expect to go to the gym and feel good in the first two weeks of quitting. Hell, I wasn't able to work out for several months. So uh, probably over a year, really, I wasn't able to lift weights because of what my body had gone through from quitting nicotine, THC, energy drinks, adult media content. It's like having the flu. Take it easy on yourself because withdrawal might be hard enough, okay? Cravings. Again, if you want to join our wait list for the Kick It uh, supplement, Crave Less, there's a reason why we're calling that, um, right? Something to temporarily reduce oral cravings that does not exist anywhere else in the world. We made it. Um, cravings are the worst withdrawal for many. Now, supplements as I said earlier, are not a magic thing, okay? It's not a magic, it's, it's not. The mindset is though, what is it that you actually crave in life? If it was weed, weed would have satisfied your cravings a long time ago and you wouldn't need to be smoking more and more and more and more and more and building up more of a dependence and more of a tolerance. Weed does not satisfy the things that you actually crave in life. Go back to the list of things that you wrote down, okay? I want better health. I want more money so I can do X, Y, and Z. I want better physical shape. I want the reasons why you're qu quitting. Those are the things that you actually crave in life. Now, what actions do you need to take to satisfy the things that you actually crave in life? That's the mindset to get around a craving. And yeah, you know what? When you quit smoking weed, you're probably going to feel a bit anxious. You're going to have cravings. It's your body's way of trying to get you to take action on the things that actually matter. I just don't want you to get tripped up and wind up taking action on doing more drugs, consuming more of a substance. Now, Again, you can join our wait list. Oh, on cravings too. Best book on that, Rational Recovery, um, Identification of the Addicted Voice. There's two voices in your head when you quit a drug. There's the human brain, Frank. Then there's the addicted voice, the it voice, whatever you want to call it. When you hear 
anything that's encouraging you to take a drug, anything that leads to that, okay? That's the addicted voice talking. Identify what it's saying and then say cancel, cancel, cancel. You could also be more vulgar in your, you know, whatever language if that's your your approach. But the goal to stopping a craving is identifying the voice that's that's responsible for it shutting it down, getting up, and then taking action on something else. The best thing you can typically do is moving. We're going to talk a little bit about deep breathing and some other techniques in a few minutes. Anxiety. I want to talk about anxiety because a lot of people are going to face anxiety when they first quit. Now, of course you do. Okay. And this is why your brain has been hijacked. Your brain has been tricked into thinking that weed or whatever the drug is, is just as important as food or water. You've now stopped giving that drug to your body. So we have anxiety. It's your body's way of saying, hey, that was important. If you were starving hungry, right? Like take a little child, a newborn baby. When they're starving hungry, they scream. It's anxiety. It's their body's way of letting them know, hey, you got to find food and you got to find food fast. Not the best mechanism in the world, but it it, it gets them fed from the parents, all right? So that's, that's one. That's why you have anxiety. It's your body trying to drive you to take action on something. Just make sure you direct it towards the right thing. Two, if you've been addicted to weed for several years, if you've been addicted to substances like I was for several years, it's like meeting someone new. This is like going on a blind date with yourself, okay? It's normal to have anxiety. What Oftentimes happens though, as you get to know that person after a month, two months, three months, a lot of that anxiety goes away and that anxiety turns into enjoyment. That That's a lot of what the anxiety is. You don't know the sober version of you. And we're about to find out what that version of you is. And it's, it's, it's anxiety provoking. Now, some people are going to get anxiety because of a variance in heart rate. Okay. And this, and I, I've had one, two cases where I've seen this actually be dangerous. You go speak to your doctor and they will most likely recommend a a medication to help control heart rate or supplementation. But understand that these changes in heart rate can uh, spike anxiety. If your heart starts to beat faster when you quit, that can trigger a panic attack. Now, again, deep breathing, there's different techniques out there to decrease heart rate and even non-medicated techniques. Okay, I love box breathing, the physiological side. Shout out to Dr. Andrew Huberman for introducing that to the YouTube world and exercise. This too shall pass. Remember that. So if you're getting an anxiety, I would recommend trying the physiological side, or especially if you're getting a craving, both of these are great breathing methods, okay? Um, What you're seeing here is the physiological size. So this is two, uh, one long inhale through the nose, another short one. So followed by a large exhale through the mouth. Okay. So this is like, uh, inhale through the nose, long breath, another quick inhale through the nose, and then a long exhale. So That's the physiological side. Box breathing, you breathe in for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds. Breathe in for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds. These are great techniques that are fast acting to shut down cravings or to shut down anxiety, okay? And I want to, this is so important. Practice these techniques. These techniques are to be practiced because they're fast acting, It's one thing to tell you to go take a cold shower and to exercise and to read books about anxiety or go to therapy. But when you're sitting there in the middle of a business deal and you're anxious because you think it's going to fall through or it fell through, you need something that's just as quick as taking a hit of weed or consuming an edible or, you know, taking a hit of nicotine, maybe not an edible. It takes like 90 minutes to kick in, but you need something fast acting. And that's exactly what deep breathing techniques can be. So please practice those things. Insomnia. A lot of people are going to be dealing with insomnia when they first quit smoking weed. Uh, Your endocannabinoid system plays a huge role in sleep regulation. Weed damages sleep. Yes, you may fall asleep faster, but weed prevents REM sleep. Now, when we talk about weed as a cure for anxiety, 
your brain heals from the day-to-day good and bad that has occurred throughout REM sleep. When you go into dream sleep, okay, and you can look up the work of Matthew Dr. Walker, Matthew Dr. Matthew Walker on sleep. He has a great, great episode with Joe Rogan on this. Okay, please go look at it. REM sleep is where your brain makes sense of all the various things that have occurred throughout the day. So if you're not getting REM sleep because weed stops REM sleep, and now you can't make sense of all the things that are happening in your life day to day, do you think you're going to wake up more anxious or less anxious? The answer is more anxious because your brain can't make sense of things. And if you're like me and you smoked for years, you have years worth of stuff that your brain is trying to make sense of that's been put on the back burner. And this is why we see a rebound in REM sleep when we quit smoking weed in dream sleep. This is why the dreams are so intense. View the dreams like you're going to the movie theater. Don't fight it. Don't go taking a bunch of pills. Don't start popping benzos to fall asleep. That's also a sedative. That's not what we want. We want deep restorative sleep. And it's going to take a minute for your body to get back to it. Exercise, cold shower, hot shower before bed, reading, whatever you need to do to do it, do it. What about those of you who suffer from PTSD? If you truly have PTSD and you're getting night tears and it's stopping your sleeping, I want you to go talk to your doctor or a psychiatrist rather about the use of P-R-A-Z-O-S-I-N. This is a common blood pressure medication that reduces the release of noradrenaline, norepinephrine, adrenaline while we're sleeping. PTSD for people that have been through trauma is when you go to bed at night, your brain is supposed to take you through the bad things that have happened throughout your day without you having a physiological release of norepinephrine or adrenaline. When you have PTSD, you're dumping adrenaline while you're sleeping. This medication can help to stop that process from happening, which could lead to a better night's sleep. I've also seen some people use things like Lexapro successfully. Um, If you look at the work of Dr. Matthew Walker, he recommends not using benzos, which are commonly prescribed for withdrawals, which from my experience, don't appear to be helping the situation. And I have a feeling that a large reason why they're not helping is because of the role that benzos play on negatively impacting sleep and the role that benzos negatively play on impacting the endocannabinoid system. I bet we're going to have research in the future to come out with that. And I bet we're going to see the same thing with people who are getting prescribed Adderall and other methamphetamine-based medications, amphetamine-based medications when it comes to fatigue because they're quitting a drug. Oh, your body's tired. You're going through withdrawal. So I'm going to give you Adderall. I'm going to now stimulate your body, force it into overdrive, give it even more drugs to detox because you're tired, which you should be because you're going through detox and withdrawal. I could rant for days about what's going on right now with how this is being treated, but I'm a DC, not an MD. So I have no right to talk about that. Um, Okay. Brain fog. Brain fog is going to be a very annoying symptom that a lot of you guys experience. It was the one that drove me the most nuts. How do you operate with the drug? How do you operate without the drug? Chances are you already had brain fog. You were just kind of numb to noticing it. Cold showers, sleep, eating healthy, meditation, stress relief, eating fruit, all of these simple things are going to help with brain fog, as is a key ingredient that I had on one of the slides in part one of this. Watch it again if you need to, where I talk about our Kick It product um, that's been shown to help promote more clarity. I'll put that. You can't say that any supplement helps to treat or cure brain fog, but If you read about the people who had long-term brain fog, especially some of these post-COVID patients, they all talk about a few key supplements that seem to help. So I'm just throwing that out there. Do your own research. Also, brain fog. If you are in business for yourself or if you have a professional license or your work requires a high level of thought process, one, I want you to realize your thought process is already not performing where it should be because of cannabis. Two, Chances are you are an expert in your field 
and no one's going to notice if you're a little foggy for a week or three. Okay. So a lot of people tend to blow up the brain fog and make it a big deal when it's actually not, especially in a work setting, because chances are you're good at what you do. Okay. And chances are no one's going to notice. Now, boredom. Weed does not cure the boredom. It makes us content with being bored. So many people quit smoking weed and they say to me, I'm bored. I don't know what to do since I stopped smoking weed. That was the point in quitting. Figure out what to do. Find a new hobby. Find a new passion. Find a purpose. Find a side hustle. Find a new community. Find a relationship. That's the point in quitting. The point is to allow yourself the space that boredom gives us to pursue the next thing. There's lots of things I can do today. I simply choose not to do this one thing. There's lots of things I need to do today. I simply choose not to do this one thing. Food intake. Uh, Hydration and eating fruit is probably the most important things you can do. Obviously, you want to eat foods that are rich in proteins. Okay, I think that's a good idea too. Uh, For me, I liked hard-boiled eggs. I totally avoided caffeine. Just I noticed when I quit substances, certain things I became more sensitive to. I think I was always sensitive to them. I was just too drugged up to realize it. But um, stay hydrated. Make make sure, please make sure you stay hydrated, especially if you do wind up throwing up or if you get diarrhea from this. I put a uh, affiliate link to Amazon for these keto chow drops. Check that out at the end of today's video. They're flavorless drops, no artificial anything in them. You can put them in water, and that will help with hydration when you're quitting. Mindset is everything. I talk about the keto light, the drops. I talk about our kick it product that we're releasing in a few weeks. Get on the wait list with the emails, okay? Um, pin comment, check the pin comment, join the wait list. Mindset is everything. The determination to win is the most important part of winning, okay? If you don't wake up saying, I can do this, I can get through this, I'm going to beat this, you're not going to win, period. If you lose up here, you're going to lose out there. I promise you that. If you're not mentally ready, you're never going to be physically ready. And as I said, for some of you, addiction creates a battleground and that battleground is within your body and I need you to be mentally ready for it and I need you to be physically ready for it. So please, how you view withdrawals matter. How you view yourself. Are you a winner? Are you a loser? Are you going to succeed? Or are you going to quit? How you view that matters. Motivation will fail you. Quoting Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Withdrawals is much comparable to getting punched in the mouth. This is why you need to have discipline, determination, practice, accountability, and and even support. Okay? Addiction mindset in our programs view withdrawal very, very differently differently than other things. Withdrawal is the addiction leaving your body. Withdrawal is addiction's last ditch effort trying to suck you back in. Withdrawal is something that you already experience every single day. When you're addicted to a drug, you get cravings and you get withdrawal symptoms throughout the entire day. Every time in between use, your body starts to go into cravings and withdrawal. That's why you become irritable when you're not smoking. That's why your stomach hurts and you can't eat when you're not smoking. That's why you can't sleep at night. If you're on a vacation and you can't bring weed and you can't fall asleep, you're always going through withdrawal. You experience it every day. So why are you scared of something that you've already gone through, something that you continually choose to put yourself through? Withdrawal is a signal of detox, healing, growth, and progress. We grow through struggle. I encourage you to struggle through the withdrawal. I encourage you to get through it because on the other side of that pain, I promise you is reward. I promise you is pleasure. It is there, but it is only there if you choose to get through it. Withdrawal is in many senses the death of addiction. Withdrawal is addiction's last ditch effort at trying to suck you back in. It's pulled out every stop it could. And now now you're in the final rounds. Are you going to get through it or are you going to die out? Are you going to fatigue out? Is it going to wear you down? And then what? What else in life is wearing you down that you could get through? Huh? This is the opportunity to develop a mentality that very few people have. 
It's, it's a winning mentality. I'm telling you, it's a growth mindset is what it is. Growth is the death of addiction. A growth mindset is the death of addiction. Okay. Carol D. Wick, the, the, her, the book she wrote on growth mindset. We'll link it in the video description. This is a prime time to fight. Roll with the punches. Okay. I don't need you to be in here working out four times a day, eating every meal healthy, trying to crush it at work. I don't need you to do that in the first few few days. But I do need you to not get punched in the face, and I need you to bounce around enough, throw a few little jabs at addiction here and there, going for a walk. Maybe you do a coaching session. Maybe you take some supplements. I just need you to hang in there until it fatigues out. Some of the best fighters understand the power of fatiguing out their opponent. We are going to out fatigue. You're not going to burn out. Addiction is going to burn out as long as you hang in there long enough. I say, you know, it's funny. I describe sometimes early sobriety, like escaping from jail. You got to dig a tunnel first. This is getting ready. This is the preparation. Then you got to get past the guards. Okay. Then you got to climb the fence then you got to swim with the sharks. Maybe this is withdrawal. Then you just have to survive. Then you just got to get through day-to-day -day stuff sober, even though you're not going through withdrawal anymore or anything like that. And then you're home free. Then you're home. You're good. You're good. You're out. And this isn't the type of jail where anyone's coming after you. One of my favorite anal analogies for withdrawal is um, it's the addiction leaving your body. So withdrawal is healing. Okay. Uh, withdrawal is detoxing. Withdrawal is your body winning. Withdrawal is addiction's last stand. Withdrawal is the death of addiction. I don't know if we have any Harry Potter fans here, but um, I imagined addiction to look something like Lord Voldemort. And actually, if you look at Harry Potter and you look at the story of Harry Potter and Voldemort and how he manipulates him from inside, I think it's actually very comparable to addiction. And ironically enough, the author of Harry Potter, uh, I think it was her husband or her son or someone personally struggled with addiction. And I can't help but to wonder if she had undertones of addiction throughout this movie. Nonetheless, I imagine addiction fading away just like when this guy was killed. So just something to consider, something to look at. I think a neat analogy. Withdrawal is an opportunity to build discipline to build determination, to build grit, to build accountability, to build perseverance, and to build mental toughness. This is what withdrawal is. It's an opportunity. You are not suffering. Addiction is suffering. You are getting stronger. So if you struggle with these things in your life, and you're trying to figure out, how do I get better at these things? How can I apply these things to my business? How can I apply this to my relationship? How can I apply this to working out more? Practice sobriety. Practice each of these things each day by not doing drugs. And you will inherently become better at each of these tools. You will sharpen them. You will develop them. You will fix what's broken. You'll fix the mind. What about a withdrawal timeline? Although I don't like timelines for reason I expressed earlier. For most people, most people, three to seven days are the hardest. Day 14, you start to see the light. Around day 30, dopamine starts to rebalance. Around day 90, new habits, new behaviors, and new disciplines are in. A lot of people won't even make it to day five. How do you expect to improve your life in five days? How do you expect to improve your life in five days after years of addiction? This is a false expectation. Don't fall for it. I fell for it many times. Try five years. Try 10 years. A good five years. A good 10 years. An effortful five or 10 years. Setting realist, realistic expectations, no matter how harsh that might sound, is the best service I could provide you with. 90 days, though, usually it's pretty good. Six months. Maybe some people wind up with post-acute withdrawal symptoms. I, I don't see it for the rest of someone's life. I, I think if you're experiencing it for the rest of your life, there's something else going on that we need to work on. One year and beyond, the brain is like healed, okay? So you might get some post-acute withdrawal like six months in where you're like, oh, I feel kind of crappy. Oh, I got a weird craving. Oh, I'm unusually fatigued. What's going on? It might be that. But at a year, it, I really... Get to 90 days, get to a year. Get to seven days, get to 14 days, get to 30 days, get to 90 days, get to a year, okay? That's the goal. Um, you could take this one day at a time. 
I'm not opposed for that, for those of you who, who are too overwhelmed by the idea of quitting forever. But when you decide that you're done with the addiction forever, as per my book recommendation, Rational Recovery, you never have to think about this again. You can be done. And that, to me, is actually a lot more freeing than one day at a time. But each to their own, whatever approach works for you better. These are just some post-acute withdrawal things that people may suffer from a few months in, a few weeks in, maybe not. Just know that these things often pass. If you do suffer from the obsessive thoughts, which largely is what addiction is, even though we, we, we in our programs train you to become obsessed with chasing your ambitions and breaking your addictions, um, uh, the supplement, the Kick It supplement that I mentioned does appear to have some ingredients that can help with that can promote stress relief, I should say. So just keep that in mind. Why do post-acute withdrawal symptoms happen? Uh, withdrawals that happen, you know, a few months into quitting. It, it's your body rebalancing. It's learning how to deal with stress. It's learning how to deal with emotions. It's learning, uh, it's rebalancing nutritional deficits and deficiencies. It's the brain's way of rebalancing the endocannabinoid system and dopamine and serotonin and adrenaline. There's a lot of healing that's occurring. And your body's just continuing to let you know, hey, I'm still doing my job. I'm still healing. Here's like a toolbox of stuff for you guys when it comes to withdrawals. Uh, supplementation. Again, we have a wait list in the pinned comment, the kick it wait list. You can check that out if you want. But here's the ingredients that we you know, talk about and promote. You can read about them. But again, this is a one of a kind because it's not, it's not a, it's not a capsule or a pill. Uh, it's not a lozenge. It's a one of a kind thing. Uh, but hydration, talk therapy, cold showers, reading, exercise, deep breathing, hobbies, walking, meditation, sauna, and setting a schedule, having a regimen, having a regimen and being disciplined in that regimen is how you are going to get through withdrawal, having a routine, irrelevant of how I feel based on my withdrawal symptoms, I'm going to do the best I can to stick to this routine. And then I'm going to reach into this toolbox of all these other possible things I could be doing, anything but going back to the drug. It might just be sleeping. Your body needs a lot of rest when you first quit. Give your body rest. You're not being lazy. Your body's working overtime to heal. Rest when you need to. Sometimes taking a nap, eating some food, it's one of the best things you can do for withdrawal. You're simply choosing not to do one thing so you can pursue everything else. There is an end to withdrawal symptoms. Withdrawal is pain with purpose. Withdrawal is suffering with purpose. There is a return on the energy that you're putting into the withdrawal process. There is no return on addiction. There is no purpose to the pain that you experience from addiction. There is no return on your investment for continuing this addiction. You will grow going through the withdrawal process. You will grow practicing sobriety and recovery, and you will get physical returns, mental returns, and financial returns on that investment, on recovery, on sobriety. An urgent note on reward. So many times we say, you know, What's my reward for working hard during the day? What's my reward for you know going for a jog or working out? What's my reward for all these things? First of all, reward is important, yes, because dopamine thrives on reward. But we have been so trained to be to to be rewarded for everything. Oh, you did this sport, here's a reward. Oh, you went to work today. Oh, here's a reward. Oh, you studied for your test, here's a reward when many of the things that we're doing day to day don't even deserve a reward. Society has ingrained the idea of reward into us. Come home, have a beer after work. It's a holiday, have a reward. This is ingrained into us and it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Big accomplishments, big things, that deserves a reward. There are definitely things. And you need to have a healthy reward in place because dopamine thrives on the idea of a reward. So you need to have something. But I want you to take a close look at how often you're rewarding yourself and ask yourself, what is it you're rewarding yourself for? Do I really deserve that yet? If you're not doing well in business financially, I don't know that you really deserve a vacation. It's probably going to cause more harm than good.
Okay. So I want you to think about reward because largely the, the mindset surrounding reward has been broken. And I do blame that largely on society, but it is our responsibility to fix it. And I do want you to operate for, for a brief moment, I did a video with Dr. Anna Lemke, the author of that book, Dopamine Nation. Watch the last 10 minutes of that video, okay, um, on our channel because it, it talks about this. Do an experiment where what if there wasn't a reward? What if you don't go home and smoke weed after work? What if you don't go home and smoke weed after the gym? What if that reward wasn't there? And what if you still went to work? What if you still went to the gym? I bet you would become significantly more present in that experience. I bet you would become significantly deeply connected to that experience in a much greater way than when you were constantly thinking about the next thing, right? Um, I think there's value to being present in the moment but not to an extent that if in the moment you want to do drugs, you do drugs. I also think there's value into thinking ahead into the future and just looking at it from a standpoint of what if my future doesn't have the reward after work? What if it's not a beer? What if it's not weed? What if it's going for a walk? What if it's reading a book? What if it's eating a bowl of fruit like I do? All right, guys, this is the end of our uh, part one, part one uh complete guide to quitting smoking weed. I will make a part two and a part three eventually. Then I'm probably going to have to split that up into parts three, four, five, and six because this was a lot to do this all in one shot. Um, check the pinned comment. Check the video description. Sign up for the Kick It supplement wait list. Download our free PDFs. Book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call. I have so much more than this to give. And I can't give it unless I'm talking to you because addiction is a unique and individualized experience. I can give away how to quit for free. That's 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 how good the one-on-one -on -one coaching is. Um, so anyways, and if you see our paid programs in the future, be sure to check those out as well too. All right, guys, stay tuned for part two of a complete guide on how to quit smoking weed. I'll see you back in a few days.